First time flyer, he's probably gonna black out or puke or both. Nah. <laughs> What's up guys, I'm Josh Mosman from Motocross Action Magazine and this is the insane story of how I got to fly an F-16 fighter jet. On day one of our trip, I got to ride with Major General Randy Everson, his son Ethan Everson, and F-16 crew chief Dylan Luttrell at the Everson's private track. I had a blast enjoying the orange East Coast dirt with the guys on a KTM 125 and Decal Works actually sent out our Air Force themed MXA graphics early so that Randy had them all dressed up on the bike once we got there. The Efferson's house was beautiful and it had an epic view of a lake. The track wasn't huge, but it had lots of fun technical sections that made it a good time to ride. And we were on the bikes until the sun went down before enjoying some dinner together with the Efferson family and getting more excited for our flight on Wednesday. After flying to Alabama on Sunday and riding until dark on Sunday night, Trevor and I were anxious for our first official day at the Danley Field Air National Guard base. Monday was all about learning the ins and outs of the F-16 aircraft and the Air National Guard. We also got to meet a group of guys who all serve our country in various roles and they ride and race motocross as well. During our runway photo shoot, Trevor and I got a lesson from Major General Randy Efferson about every button, switch, and lever inside of the F-16. I was blown away once I sat in the jet for the first time. Sitting in an F-16 is nothing like I thought it would be after seeing so many pictures and videos of these jets before. I didn't feel like I was in a plane, I felt like I was sitting on the tip of a rocket. The base was pretty quiet on Monday for us. This meant that we got to walk all over the flight line and even check out an F-16 that was torn apart for service inside of the one of the hangars. Each jet in the fleet is on a schedule where it gets pulled apart and rebuilt after every 300 flight hours for inspections and maintenance. Although the F-16 has been around since 1976 and our specific plane was built in 1988, everything about it was new to me. I was like a kid in the candy store getting all kinds of detailed information about these jets from Sergeant David Caton, who's been a man maintainer on the base for over 20 years. A few cool notes I wanted to share from David Caton. He said that the end of the gun's barrel is actually next to the cockpit, not on the wings as I would have guessed. And when the pilot is firing the gun, it has a certain amount of recoil as with any regular handgun. And to counter that recoil, the rudder on the tail actually flutters to keep the jet flying straight. Also, this is probably my favorite one. The fuel is spread out on the jet. It's in a tank underneath the aircraft, it's stored in the wings, and it's stored behind the seat. Fuel cells, pumps, and sensors are all used to balance out the fuel weight, centralizing mass to ensure the plane is nice and agile. Tuesday was day two on base for us, and it was a busy training day for the pilots who fly out of the 187th fighter wing, and things continued to get more serious for us as we got closer to my flight on Wednesday. Our Tuesday schedule was jam-packed with items on our pre-flight to-do list, along with a few extracurricular activities the general made sure that we were a part of. And then, yeah, I had my first flight about a year ago, and uh, up until then, I always told people how it felt, but I never really actually felt it. Yeah. And that first flight, yeah, it, it takes you by surprise. Really? You, you'll notice it. I'm gonna plug this. I wanna see if you've got good suction. All right, all right. Grab the free ends. I want you to do a half squat and cinch those things down. If you can stand up straight easily, it is not fit correctly. It should almost force you to be a little hunchback. All right. It's squeezing you pretty good down oh, yeah. there. Okay, good. This is, this is all. Now I pinch got. here and release. All right. Pinch here. Yep, right there and pull out. Sweet. The reason it needs to be so tight right there is from the time that you pull the handle to the time that you are under a open parachute yeah. is less than two seconds. So it happens like that. Yeah. 
And if you have slack there, that slack could yeah, really hurt you. Yeah, for sure. Take something with it. So. Totally. So while he's getting the jet ready to go and you're just sitting back in the back seat waiting, go ahead and pull one of these little white bags out. Yep. I would go ahead and get it ready Tasha to right use here. and have it right there. Totally. Put the extra one down here in that little bottom pocket. All right. Uh, because if you do need it, yeah, you're gonna want it fast. Ah. But hopefully how you won't need it. How often do you guys get guys that that can make it without throwing up? It's about half and half, honestly. Really? I mean, I'd say fifty. And there's no real, there's no real like definitive, I guess, thing that makes determines whether or not a person's yeah. gonna be good or, or bad at it, right? Gotcha. It's, to get ready for the flight, I was fitted in my G-suit and I was taught the ins and outs on how to eject in the case of a catastrophic failure. Good? Yeah. Any questions for me? Sounds great. Okay. Oh, ready. And so that's what's supplying air to the G-suit to inflate and deflate. Gotcha. In the G. After our lesson, Trevor and I concluded that everything in the jet was explosive. For example, when injecting from an F-16, explosives break the seat belt, they blow off the canopy glass, and a rocket blows the seat out of the cockpit. The oxygen tank that is used inside of the jet is actually connected to the seat, so it goes with you. And plus, the seat actually knows if you've been ejected at high altitude, and it gives you air through your mask to keep you breathing. Once lower, the seat will eject you from itself, and your parachute will deploy. Also, in case the plane starts to catch fire or you have other issues while you're still on the ground and you don't have time to get out yourself and you need to eject, the rocket will actually shoot the seat out of the jet and shoot you high enough to deploy a parachute and give you enough time to land safely. Now that is a pretty impressive seat. Even more on the seat, it has sensors to tell if the seat lands in water, which helps it to deploy flotation devices. And of all the tech that goes into the seat, my favorite part has to be the gyro that's built into it that detects the angle at which you've ejected and levels out the chair immediately before deploying the parachute. Even if you eject from the F-16 while the plane is upside down, as you eject, the chair would right itself up instantly midair and deploy the parachute. It's incredible. When you're in the air and he says you have the aircraft, then you can fly. <laughs> and the transfer will be, I have the aircraft, you have the aircraft. And when he says you have the aircraft, you say I have the aircraft. And that means you're flying and you have both the throttle and the stick. Yeah. So the throttle will probably be up here about mid-range or so when you're flying. And you know, full power, push it all the way forward, boom. So you can't light the afterburner in the back. He'll have to do that in the front. But like when you do a loop or something, he'll light the burner for you and then you'll, you've got the power. But all you gotta do is pull back. It only takes like 17 pounds of aft pressure to get full control deflection and 11 pounds forward. But you really don't push hard forward, right? You just pull hard back because that gives you positive Gs. If you push forward, it's gonna be like you're coming out of the jet. And you'll probably fly upside down a little bit and get, get a little bit of zero or negative G. Uh, and when you do an aileron roll, so like the second most popular topic of conversation for us was the g-loads i would be experiencing i wasn't worried about the speed the height being claustrophobic or throwing up i really only worried about the blood running out of my head under heavy g-forces and passing out i didn't know what to expect with high levels of sustained g-forces and i figured that if i passed out mid-air then my flight would be cut short i was taught to flex my legs and core muscles when under a load and I was taught on how to breathe so I wouldn't pass out from a lack of oxygen. The breathing technique was to release air and breathe it back in an instant. I definitely had never done anything like it before. Also on our Tuesday schedule was meeting with my assigned pilot, Colonel Brian Vaughn, nicknamed Thud. He assured me that we'd be safe in the air and have a good time up there. I also had to see a doctor on base for my pre-fight physical. Trevor and I both got to fly in an F-16 flight simulator and coolest of all, we got to walk on the runway and actually stand about 100 feet away or so from the pilots as they took off from their training sessions. Thanks to the general's request, they all did vertical takeoffs for us to watch before it was my turn to do the same. So I, there's days when you're like, I'm like back there going, whoa, this is kind of too much for me. Yeah. Uh, there's other days where I'm like, tell them, hey, let me, let me fly for a little bit. Nice. And, uh, but the other days when it is good to go. So cool. You tell me your body limits today. Cool. I'll keep going for that. No harm, no foul. Like I said, I flew with a guy who uh, had just gotten flying with a bunch of national aerobatic champions that yeah. would have been doing aerobatics, but the acceleration what was getting him. Mm -hmm. And so we had to take some breathers. Yeah. And like, all right, dude, that's good. I've had other guys that have never been in an airplane in their life, 
and they're screaming the whole time going push it up even more come on yeah. so it all depends man so this is your ride and cool. that's what i want you to you remember Super so cool. no matter what um i always say this with him in here you're going to be a hero no matter what all right so what happens in the jet stays in the jet between you and i cool. um i may tease you a little bit but it'll be between us it'll be yeah. an inside joke all yeah. right but uh so you're gonna do you're gonna do great no matter what when Wednesday came, I was nervous. It felt like race day at a national, only I had no idea what to expect. It was hard not to be claustrophobic once I had all of my gear on and the canopy was shut. On the runway before we were getting ready to take off, I was praying to God, just like I do on race day, only this time, instead of thanking God for the opportunity to race, I was thanking Him for the once in a lifetime opportunity to fly in this jet. Being thankful helps me cope with the nerves. Everything was calm seconds before we took off and then we were in the air before I knew it. We continued to fly above the ground about 100 feet until we got to the end of the runway and once we got there, Brian went full throttle and pulled up for our vertical takeoff. The g-forces were intense and I made sure to look out and watch the earth peel away as we climbed straight up to 10,000 feet. Brian was adamant that I didn't miss this moment by just slapping my head back on the headrest and staring straight into the clouds. He wanted me to watch the earth slowly get smaller as we went vertical and at this time the g-suit was squeezing my legs and it kind of startled me uh, making it feel like the g-forces were worse than they actually were later on i figured out that that was just the suit squeezing but it was definitely something i had to get used to once we got into an airspace where we could really play around we went right away into it with some loops and some rolls the rolls were fun but the loops man they created some gnarly g-forces and i really realized how tough this experience was going to be I had the mindset of just surviving the flight. Right away, I was getting crushed into my seat and I was already feeling the fatigue. Similar of how you would feel midway through a race. You have the mindset of just getting to the finish line and that's kind of what I had to have while flying in this F-16. The G-forces were beating me up and there were multiple times where I actually was struggling to breathe. The G-forces were literally crushing me into my seat. Instead of letting out short bursts of air, I let out all of my air instead and I was being just crushed by what felt like a sumo wrestler sitting on my chest. Brian, he was awesome. He coached me through it. He told me to hold my breath for at least three seconds in between and that was a huge deal. If I didn't hold my breath correctly while just flying in four and five Gs for just 15 seconds, those short little spurts, it wasn't too bad. But once we started hitting the bigger G-forces for closer to 30 seconds long, that short pressure release breathing was super important. Before it was my turn to fly, we had a scheduled meeting with two other pilots flying in formation. Honestly, I can't believe this happened and I can't believe I'm actually sharing this footage with you guys right now because it doesn't feel real. Brian explained to me how far the other guys were once we were in the air and once they were within about 12 miles, he began to count down the miles between us and them as they were coming head on towards us. I could watch them on the radar until they were within visual range and our gap shrunk by a mile every few seconds. Once they got closer, they were coming up on our wings quickly and as they approached, it was just an insane experience. One of the pilots gave me a thumbs up once he was close, but once their wings were within three feet of ours, they were definitely not playing around anymore. Brian flew steady and made some bank turns while the other pilots had their eyes locked on our wings following our every move. The other aspect you don't see from the ground when watching these guys fly in formation is how much the planes oscillate mid-air. Yes, these guys were steady, but they were definitely bobbing around a lot more than I expected while the, the whole time they had their eyes glued on our wing. We led the three-man formation for a while and then had one of the jets fly directly over us as we shifted over into flying off of his wing. At this point, I felt like I was in a Star Wars movie seeing another plane right above us as we shuffled back. 
While fly flying formation, I was in awe and I just couldn't believe this opportunity and it didn't feel real to see two other jets flying so close to us. To finish it off, our teammates split from us identically while throwing flares and at the time I could only see one because I only have one set of eyes looking one direction but now watching this 360 GoPro is just so, so cool to see these guys split off at the same time. I do have to report, however, that during our time in formation, I did start to feel a little queasy and I was getting hot, sweaty, and lucky to have a barf bag strapped to my leg. We hadn't even pulled any big G-forces during that time, but I still wasn't feeling well after watching those guys so close to us. I made sure to turn off the intercom as instructed by Brian, because even though it's pretty loud inside of the plane, he definitely didn't want to hear me over the intercom getting sick. I made sure to turn it off, but I'm pretty sure that Brian still heard me from uh, the seat behind him. However, he didn't, uh, didn't complain. Only a few minutes after getting sick, it was my turn to fly. And as you can notice in the video, my hands have been in my lap for the whole flight, but now Brian had switched the controls over to me and I was ready to go. In the days leading up to the flight, the general was warning me not to be timid when it was my turn to take over the wheel. When I originally flew to Alabama, I had no idea that there was actually the chance that I could be the one flying the plane and operating it once we we're up in the air. But once we got there, Randy explained that and I was just blown away and could not believe it. He made sure that I wouldn't be timid and he was adamant about it. Finally, after flying in the simulator the day before, that helped boost some confidence and I felt comfortable knowing the capabilities of the plane and also knowing Brian's history and experience. Brian's been in the military for about 25 years. He's the vice commander for the 187th Fighter Wing and he's received multiple major awards and decorations and he's flown in seven combat deployments overseas. Brian announced that it was my plane and I stated back to him, I have the aircraft, just like I was instructed. I started small and then worked my way up to some pretty cool corners, hitting light G-forces before working my way up to four Gs. It was gnarly trying to control the plane while being crushed into my seat, but I knew we had a lot of ground below us if I made any mistakes and I knew Brian was right there to catch me if I fell. The whole time I was monitoring our altitude, our speed, and how much fuel we had. I wanted to go wide open the whole time, but that also meant that my flight would be slightly shorter because we were up there for as long as we had fuel. Soon after I got the wheel, Brian told me to try doing a roll and it worked, just like a real life video game. While going about 460 miles an hour, I tried to do another roll, but this time I wanted to be a little more fancy. I rolled inverted, but once upside down, I saw that our nose was actually tracking downwards instead of continuing to roll to the right. So I pushed forward to try to retain our altitude, but however, we're upside down while I'm pushing forward, so that's really directing us upwards. Well, for a split second, we hung upside down and I knew it wasn't right. Then Brian took over the controls immediately. He said, I have the plane, flipped it back over. I took my hands off the controls, put them back in my lap, and almost instantly, he flipped us over back right ways up. Brian laughed about the incident, and later he explained that losing altitude is normal on rolls, I was putting stress on the wings in the opposite way and he said if he let me keep on going I could have overstressed the plane. My time for flying was over that incident but I was plenty satisfied. I had pulled some solid g-forces myself, I did a roll or two and I made a mistake that got both of our heart rates going. I knew Randy would be proud because I definitely was not timid with this F-16. Soon after my time at the controls I got sick for the second time we took another five minute breather and then we were back to it. In order to be cautious with how much video footage was published, the 187th security team watched over all of our GoPro video before giving us the green light to post this video. They deleted the GoPro clip from our vertical takeoff from the airport. However, we did get another epic vertical climb from midway through the flight. After my time behind the wheel, it was time to do some low level flying. Brian flipped us upside down at 10,000 feet and then tracked us straight down to 1,000 feet. When we were flying, it felt like we were going vertical, completely straight down as I could feel my weight push into the seat belts like a roller coaster. But now that I'm watching the footage back on the GoPro, it wasn't totally vertical to get back down. Once we were down flying low level at 1000 feet, it was ultra cool. We could see the trees, you could see the buildings, the beautiful green Alabama countryside. We pulled some G-forces down there and it was just a lot of fun. Then it was time for another vertical climb. Now this was the second climb of the trip. First was off of the airport. As soon as we took off, we went vertical to 10,000 feet. 
This time we started from 1,000 feet and went straight up to 10,000 feet and man, it was an epic experience. If you think about it, at this point we're not really flying off the wings, we're just launching straight into the sky like a rocket, all off of F-16 power. The F-16 is also 49 feet and 4 inches long, 16 feet and 8 and a half inches tall, and it has a wingspan of 33 feet. And according to Randy, the factory edition price tag of this F-16 is $25 million. That was wild. <laughs> I got, <laughs> I, yeah, I got, I got sick. And the first part was good, and then I got, then I got sick once, and then I was really good. And then I got sick again, and then it was, it was good again at the end. It was, it was tough. It was fun, though. It was really cool. I don't know if this is good. There's no way to compare. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it was really fun. Introducing the man who put this whole thing together, Major General Randy Efferson. Hi, I'm Randy Efferson. I'm a Major General in your United States Air Force. And uh, I've been in the Air Force and the Air National Guard for 30 years in total between the two services. And uh, currently I work at United States Air Force Central Command at Shaw Air Force Base, South Carolina. And I help with the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria uh, as my primary job. And I also flew uh, F-16s, both active duty and in the Air National Guard for about 25 years. I've got uh, 10 combat deployments and uh, I've had a ball. It is so much fun. Uh, when I got promoted to a one-star general, I actually don't get to fly anymore, which is, you know, I've got my own opinions about, about that. I'm still healthy enough to fly, so I'd love to still be flying. Uh, but I bought some bikes and started racing motocross. And uh, I've always loved riding dirt bikes since I was a little kid riding an XR75. And uh, my young son, Ethan Efferson, uh, rides a 125 KTM. And uh, he, is, he is right there starting to pass me. And so here in the Alabama, we race the, uh, the Southern Series, in the Alabama Series, I should say, for outdoor motocross. And I've met a lot of great individuals. We've got a crew chief, uh, Dylan Luttrell, that works on our F-16s here. And we've got uh, a gentleman from Fort Benning that trains Army, so we're a joint force here. And uh, he also races motocross. And uh, I'm really honored that Motocross Action Magazine came out to meet the men and women that do the job of the United States Air Force and the Air National Guard, which is to defend the United States. Uh, but also have some great hobbies that uh, bring a lot of good fellowship and togetherness. So it's, it's really neat. When I was a little kid, I was probably uh, five or six to eight years old. My dad bought some new 1970 and 71 CT Honda CT70s. And I used to ride on the front seat. Sorry, jet noise, sound of freedom. So anyway, I used to ride on the front seat with my dad doubling me. and. Uh, so in about 1972, I was really into dirt bikes and I got uh, the CT70 from my dad and started riding that when I was like six or seven years old, something like that. And then I got a little older, I had an XR75, but I never had good bikes. You know, I remember having three master links in my chain to, to make it work. And, uh, but we would, we would read Motocross Action Magazine, which I think started about that same time. And it was like the new magazine that talks about dirt bikes. So we would get a copy at the bookstore and, uh, and read that thing cover to cover, take it to school. And still to this day, I take Motocross Action Magazine with me when I fly my own airplane to South Carolina. So anyway, with reading Motocross Action Magazine, I was very familiar with uh, Jody Weisel's family history because his father flew B-17s in World War II. And you know, my uncle was killed in a submarine in World War II. Um, as well. So I just always felt this connection with the magazine, with Jody, although we've never met. But I thought, you know, people that work on dirt bikes are also the same kind of people that work on airplanes. They're just people that are mechanically inclined. They like being outside. They like working on stuff. And a lot of the people here actually know how to ride motorcycles. They don't necessarily ride motocross, but they're very mechanical. And I thought, you know, I bet there's some people that in dirt bike that ride dirt bikes that would love to know about the benefits of the Air National Guard and the United States Air Force. One of our crew chiefs, Dylan Luttrell, he's putting himself through college. He's 20 years old. He's fixing to go to uh, Auburn University, but he's going to use the GI Bill and the Alabama Tuition Assistance Program. So when he finishes college with his four-year degree, he will have no bills. And that's such a benefit 
that I wanted to try to get that word out to the rest of the country and the motocross action readers. You know, in motocross, we talk about when you hit a jump and you land and you hit a G out, meaning your suspension totally compresses, and then you come back out and maybe hit another jump, like in Supercross. Motocross racers will feel the G-forces where you weigh one to probably four to six, seven times, if you look at your Lip Pro data, G-forces, but that's instantaneous. What Josh will experience in that F-16 is the capabilities to sustain nine times the force of gravity for as long as you have gas. You know, you can do that. And of course, you'll be losing altitude while you do that because you're bleeding energy. But it's a, it's a remarkable sensation. And he's going to receive training this week on life support equipment and the G-suit and how to do a G-straining maneuver to make sure he keeps the blood in his head so he doesn't pass out. And the, uh, the helmet also gives you about 60 PSI of pressurized oxygen so that you can breathe when you're under those G-forces. And all the survival equipment in case he were to have to eject from the aircraft because he'll have a, a full parachute, harness, and survival equipment if in case that does happen, which I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, so about five years ago, my son and I bought bikes, and we've never had motocross bikes, just woods bikes, you know, previously, PW50 is what he had. Uh, so now we actually, for the first time in our lives, have good bikes. And about three years ago, we did our first race, and I've watched him grow and get into the big bikes now. Like I say, he's on a KTM 125, and I, I'm not very good. I've only been racing for three years, really only two. Uh, so we're able to race the D-Class together. But what I love about it and why it's attractive to me as a fighter pilot, I mean, being a fighter pilot, let's face it, it's an aggressive sport. It's, you, you know, two men enter, one man leave is kind of the, the thing we say because dogfighting and uh, it's not just one-on-one, -on -one, but it's a team. So you'll have a whole team of four, eight, 12 or more aircraft going against opposition that's of equal size or bigger sometimes. Uh, so I love like lining up on the gate, a whole shot. It's like, all right, here we go. Who's gonna get it? And, and everybody goes. And it's, and it's such a good thing to teach my son uh, responsibility for his equipment and that aggressive spirit that if you're gonna be anything or do anything in life, you gotta go out there and go after it and don't let anything stand in your way. And I think, again, those, those exact traits are the same traits that we need in our crew chiefs and people that work on aircraft, our civil engineering folks. I mean, these are folks that we take out into a desert, austere environment where there's no base, and we say, build us a runway and stand up operations. And they go out there and they do it. So we take people that are 18 to 20 years old and we give them all the responsibility that they can ever handle, and they do a terrific job. You know, people talk about the younger generation, but I'm here to tell you, that it's an impressive generation because they have a lot more capability and smarts and training than I had when I was that age. And again, you see that in motocross, each generation's getting better and better. The safety gets better, the training gets better, their capabilities get better, and that's exactly what happens in the military. And again, you are training people to have that aggressive spirit and I think that just, it's good for the country and it takes you where you want to go in your life. And, and the other thing is, I'll, I'll mention this, I was an F-16 demo pilot for a couple of years and I went and talked to tens of thousands of people after an air show. And they would say, hey, you know, how was it to fly the F-16? And I would say, hey, it's a lot of fun. And boom, they launch into their story about how they were in the military for two, four, six, or 30 years, you know, like me. And they always look back on it like that was the best time in their life because of the people that they were with and the mission that they were doing. They went home at night and they felt good about themselves and their family and their country. So flying an F-16, it is so much fun. I mean, to, to take off, to hit the afterburners and feel yourself just press back in the seat with about three to four Gs of lateral G-forces on your body and then you take off and just, you know, like a thousand feet when I was doing the F-16 demo is a very short takeoff roll. You almost couldn't get the landing gear up fast enough to not overspeed it. And then to have the power to be able to pull in a vertical climb and go up to 10,000 feet right after takeoff is amazing. And then pull the power and come straight back down, go supersonic, 
nine G's. I mean, it, and it's one of those things that you have to work up to. You don't just get in and do that. And I think I'll bet a Coke that after Josh flies, he's going to spend the rest of the day sleeping uh, because it, it's something you have to build up to, just like motocross training, to build up, you know, 10 minute, 20 minute, 30 minute motos. So again, the physical aspects are very similar and the more fit you are, the better you can be. And then reflexes, natural abilities and training. I also want to introduce a T-38 fighter pilot instructor, Dave Hunziker, call sign Deadeye, who also races motocross and trains T-38 pilots. All right, my name is David Hunziker, go by Deadeye. Uh, we came out here to shoot pictures with our motorcycles and the F-16 here. I'm from the 50th Flying Training Squadron up in Columbus, Mississippi. It's just to the northwest of here. We train the new Air Force pilots before they go on to fly things like the F-16 behind me here. I've been flying airplanes for about 15 years and in the Air Force for eight years now. And with the motocross, I've only been riding motocross for four years, but even at this point I can see that the riding the dirt bike on the side actually helps me with my flying. Just the hand-eye correlation, the coordination, the depth perception, and then having your brain work at very high speeds, doing very precise things, it definitely translates well into flying. So even the motocross now helps with flying at this point in time. There are hundreds of amazing men and women who serve at the Donnelly Field Air National Guard Base, and this is our new friend Dylan Luttrell, an F-16 mechanic and a fellow motocross racer. Hey, uh, my name is Dylan Luttrell. I'm with the 187th Fighter Wing, uh, the Alabama Air National Guard. I am a crew chief out here uh, on the F-16s. I joined back in 2017 um, when I found out that the Air National Guard will pay for 100% of my in-state tuition. So I, I come out here, I do my one week in a month, a couple weeks a year, and uh, I, I work on the jets while I'm out here and go on trips. And in return, they're pretty much paying for my schooling. And I plan on taking my education further and eventually becoming an officer and becoming a pilot, um, whether it's out here or in the civilian world, just becoming a pilot. Man, I, I really love my job uh, being a crew chief out here on the F-16s. I come out here every day and get the jets ready in the morning, introduce the pilots to it, make sure everything's squared away, send them on their way. And when it comes back, I fix whatever's broke, or if it's not broke, then I turn it ready for the, the next go. And it's, it's really awesome, and it's really kind of high pace and um, on the fly. And it, there's, it, every day is not the same. Um, there's always something different going on, always something different that needs to be worked on. And that, that's probably what I love most about it, is how it's not a typical nine to five job. You never know what's gonna either break or need to be fixed today, and, and that's pretty awesome. And that, this job has really helped me with uh, my mechanical skills, uh, learn different tools, learn the best way to use them, and that's carried over a lot working on my dirt bikes. I do all my own personal maintenance, and that, that's helped a lot, you know, learn how to turn a wrench really the right way and, and uh, looking at stuff that may not be right. You know, we, we pay really close attention and detail out here on something that maybe has the slightest bit of play in it or whatever, and I take that same transition to looking at my dirt bike, something with the slightest bit of play, you know, then I'll look further into it, make sure that everything's the way it working the way it should be. I race the Alabama Motocross Series in Alabama, and we, uh, I won the um, Alabama Motocross Series last year in two classes, the American Heroes and the Open D. Um, I ride uh, a 2020 RMZ 450 and uh, I got a YZ uh, 252 that I like to rip on every now and then. Finishing things off, I want to say a huge thank you to Major General Randy Efferson and his family for setting up this entire operation. Also, thank you to Colonel Brian Vaughn for giving me the ride of a lifetime. And also, thank you to the entire crew at the 187th Fighter Wing at Donnelly Field. After spending four days in Alabama and three action-packed days on base, Trevor Nelson and I were thoroughly impressed with how respectful and how smart each individual on base was. This was an experience we will not soon forget.